Okay, let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we can pray to you, that we can have the voices to speak to you. May our Holy Spirit be upon us and be with Kokto as he speaks with conviction, with power, and may everyone listen, have understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's move to the second slide. All right, Israel's expectation, even from the very start, is for an earthly kingdom. Because in John 6, 14, we read, Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into the temple himself, into, into the mountain, mountain himself, himself alone. Okay, they had seen the miracle. And the miracle was the feeding of the 5,000. And that gave the people a thrill because, you know, it's such a miracle, such a, a wonderful thing like food, right? So they wanted to make him king. And what did he do? He perceived that they wanted to take him by force to be a king. <laughs> by force. In other words, he did not want to be king, but they were pressuring him to be king. So he departed. All right. <clears throat> now, the words that were preached is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <clears throat> and this it is repeated over and over again. Let's read it also in Luke 17, 21. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, <coughs> the kingdom of God is within you. Okay, the kingdom of God, which is at hand, is within you. It's inside of you. So it's a thing of the heart, a spiritual kingdom. And in Luke 17, 20, it says before, verse 21, it is said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation now observation is with the eyes is outside so is it a, a a literal kingdom a physical kingdom or a kingdom within you okay and this idea of a kingdom within you not from observation outside of you is thought in uh, matthew 3 john thought that to judea in matthew 3 to jordan and so forth, Zebulon, and in Matthew 10, 6, Jesus instructed the 12 to the lost sheep of Israel. So it was a message for Israel. The kingdom is within you. It's not from observation. Okay. Now, but however, the idea of an earthly kingdom was obsessive with Israel. Now we read this in John eleven forty seven 47, and so on. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we for this man do with many miracles? Okay, so Jesus was doing miracles and people were flocking to him. And the hierarchy, the, the, the clergy, the chief priests in council saw this and they were threatened. And so in verse 48, if, they met. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Now, remember, at that time, Israel under Rome was at peace with Rome. I mean, Rome had set up tax collectors. They were collecting taxes. They had appointed King Herod as uh, a king whom Rome approved of. So things were at peace. And, but the, 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 the priests were saying, if people unite under Jesus, then the Romans will be threatened. Uh, that we are a divided nation. Oh, the Romans love it because they've got us under control. But if Jesus united the people, the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. To take away the power of the priest over the people and over the nation. So they were threatened. Verse 49. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, you know nothing at all. Okay, so he was taking charge. You guys know nothing. Let's see what else he says. Now consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. Okay, so let's not rock the boat. Let's not 
that's this piece that we have is just perfect. We've got our hierarchy, our position over the nation, right? the priest. But this man, one man, Christ, must die for the or the whole nation perish from the Romans. So this is how they thought deviously. Okay, verse 51. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. Okay, the prophecy was correct, but the motivation was wrong. 52. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. Okay, so that's where it all began. They were threatened by his popularity. All right, in John 18, Christ is a spiritual kingdom of truth. And this was that conversation with um, the governor, right? As, as he, as the governor began to question Christ. Pilot. Pilot. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. So the question from Pilate was, is your kingdom of this world? Okay, is it an earthly kingdom? What's the answer, right? He said, no, if my kingdom was of this earth, my people will fight. If that's the kind of kingdom I want, we will be fighting. And then in verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. So bottom line, my kingdom is a kingdom of truth, a spiritual kingdom. Now, about Israel. Uh, Jesus told many parables. Now, first of all, we must understand the house of Israel is, uh, is likened symbolically to a vineyard, or a vineyard of grapes or a vineyard of figs. Okay? And let's read Isaiah 5, 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. So he looked to Israel for judgment, for righteousness. But there was none. And so uh, Christ spoke about the fruitless fig tree. The fruitless Israel. Okay? Okay, let's read. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then he said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall Think about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, well. And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. All right. So this trees, I'm a bit of a gardener. And when you, when you don't have much land like me, <laughs> you want to use every square inch. But fruit, the trees would take up space. And you dung it and it doesn't bear fruit, just a lot of leaves. You get so exasperated, you're ready just to cut it down. Dung it, dung it means to put fertilizer like cow dung. Manure. manure. <laughs> okay. So this fig tree, this Israel, was not bearing fruit. Although Christ was doing everything for it. God was doing everything for it. All right, let's go on. All right, in Hosea 9.10, again, it talks about the vine. Not, but this time about grapes. All right. And what happened to Israel? I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree. Okay, the first stripe. That one is the first fruit. Right? So 
uh, Jesus or God wants to look for the first fruits, the first blossom, the first, um, you know, the first fruit is so exciting when it comes out. <laughs> we really look forward to it. So God is looking for the first fruits from this fig tree, Israel. Yes, I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time. But they went to Baal pure and separated themselves unto that shame and their abominations were according as they loved. And Isaiah also said, the vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel. Okay, so when we hear the vineyard or the fig tree, it's about Israel. Yes. Right now, in Matthew 3, 8 to 10. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Okay, now Israel always saw themselves as children of Abraham, right? Genetic, born and therefore saved, born and therefore chosen. This was where the problem is. And they did not bear fruit for the others, for the world. Israel was raised to bring the message of God to the world. But they were inward looking. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now, how do you uh, destroy a, a tree completely that it has no chance of growing? Now, I sometimes, oftentimes, because banana is so easy to grow, <laughs> when you cut down a banana tree, the mother root would just spring more bananas. So to kill off the tree, you cut it at the root, you dig up the roots. Right? For those that are very powerful and want to grow all that, you dig up the roots and that's the end of it. So that's how you terminate completely a tree that's strong. Right? Now, Israel, again, a figless fruit tree. Now, we see this story in Luke and Matthew. So I put them side by side on left and right. And the, the story progresses both uh, 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 almost in tandem. All right, let's read. Luke 19, 45 says, And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he taught daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him. All right, so you know the story well. Jesus cleared the temple because they were turning into a thriving, <laughs> prosperous business. So, and then he said, this is still my house, my father's house, but you've turned it into something awful. Matthew 21. Verse 9 says, And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So here in the words of Christ, he is very possessive of the temple. He loves the temple. It is my house, my father's house. Okay, this is how he he, he, he felt about this in the beginning. All right, let's see him changing over time. All right, Luke 19 on the left. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. For the days shall come upon thee, and thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Jesus loved the temple, loved Jerusalem, loved the people, and he wept when he saw what must come over them, that their enemies, Rome, would come and there would not be one stone upon another. So it was not wickedness, it was not that anger, it, he wept. 
This is how he felt about how Israel, what Israel did to his house. Right, Matthew 21. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in, in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only. And said unto it, let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. So this fig tree, Israel, he wanted fruit from them so badly. But they rebelled. They killed the prophets. And so the pronouncement was, let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. Now, when I read those words, it's so terminal, so final. No fruit grow. Henceforth, from now, till forever. Okay? And therefore, because Jesus felt that way, he wept. So it's kind of a, a broken heart for something you love, for people he loved. All right. Then he told another parable. The two sons. And this was, the two sons, this parable was a question Jesus asked to the chief priests and the elders. Okay? So this was directed at the chief priests and the elders. It starts with Matthew 21, 28. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But after that, he repented and went. Okay, so this was to the chief priests and the elders. And he said, there was this man, two sons. The first, he said, go and work. And the son said, no, I will not. But afterward, the son went anyway. So he obeyed finally, right? Okay, and, and there was a second son. And he came to the second and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Okay, the second one said, I'll go, but he did not go. Okay, so now, then the question that Jesus asked to the chief priests and elders was, which of them, whether of them, two, did the will of his father? Which are you, chief priests and the elders, the first or the second? They, they replied. They say unto him, the first. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Okay, so Jesus said, no, 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 no. You're not the first. Uh, the first was the publicans and the harlots. They heard the gospel and they went in first before you. All right? And then verse 32. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And you, when you had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. All right. And you saw this. You saw the sinners go in before you, but didn't, it didn't do anything to your heart. You repented not afterward. Even when you see people responding to the gospel, you did not. Okay. And, and the words, last of all, were applied in this parable. Let's read how it's applied. Matthew 21, 33, hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hatched it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to the husbandmen, all these farmers, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his hus servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. So this is the story of Jesus going away and left um, the, the, the fig tree or the of, of God's people under the, the, the care of a, a certain householder. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first and they did unto them likewise. Last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. 
So they sent one servant after another, right? Prophets after prophets, until it was like not working. They killed him. And last of all, he sent his son. Having yet therefore one son, his well beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. Okay, only one son. And last of all, there was no other option after this one son because he had only one son last of all what happened but when the husband men saw the son they said among themselves this is the heir come let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance and they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him when the lord therefore of the vineyard cometh what will he do unto those husbandmen? Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. So the issue for Israel and for us is fruit. Okay. But Israel went very far. They slew him. They slew Jesus. And no fruit. In fact, it's sad to think that this slaying was their fruit. A fruit that is so unbecoming, so a tragic fruit of Israel. So initially, Jesus said, My house, my house. And then it became in Matthew 23, he said, woe, 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 woe unto you all. And then he said in Matthew 23, 38, behold, your house, not his house, not his father's house anymore. Your house is left unto you desolate. Now, a lot of my friends are pro-Israel, uh, Zionists. In fact, um, so Zionist that I've been talking with him for seven years <laughs> and he's still <laughs> unconvinced now what he said to me was uh, surprising and a lot of i hope it's not a sentiment that most people have it's, it's like this if if god does not save israel then god will lose face why because god chose israel god started israel god will lose face right? in other words the rebellion of israel uh, is something that God uh, has to yield to. He has to save them because he chose them. Right? Now, is that so? Because the promises made to Israel, to literal Israel, were conditional. Right? So we read the condition, if, in the words if, and the words then, of the covenant. Let's read. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my commandment or covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. All right, so very clearly it's conditional. So covenant was made, right? In the Old Testament, God and Israel. Now, God made a perfect agreement with Israel. There's nothing wrong with the covenant, the agreement. But Israel did not live up to their side. They broke the covenant. They went after other gods. So God said, well, I disregard you because you broke the original covenant, the old covenant. And then it was right for God to discard the covenant, right? to break, to come to put that covenant to an end. because. Israel broke it. All right, now, this phrase, the earth is mine, is kind of amazing. I want to tell you uh, how God does not just look at the, his people, but his creation of the earth. Now, in 2 Chronicles 36, 21, all right, we read this. This is Jeremiah giving the prophecy. Jerusalem, first, Jerusalem will be in Babylon 70 years. That's what Jeremiah said, and 
then in 2 Chronicles 36, 21, referring to this 70 years, it says, Jerusalem enjoyed Sabbath for 70 years, especially when it was desolated. In other words, what is happening is this. There's Jerusalem. They are rebellious. And God allowed Babylon to capture it and to bring his people into Babylon for 70 years. Now, when Jerusalem was made desolate, then in 2 Chronicles, it says, it was even when desolated, right, ruined, because uh, the rebellion, right, the disobedience of Israel wasn't in it. Jerusalem enjoyed her Sabbath, rested, free from disobedience, free from rebellion. So God does not want his people and his Jerusalem or his land to be disobedient. This is how he regards even the land, even the earth is mine, even the land is spiritual. Okay, now this same concept was applied to um, they are going into the promised land. All right, uh, and I want you to go back and read this for yourself because it's very long. Okay, in Leviticus, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep the Sabbath unto the Lord. Okay, so when he sent his people into the land, if they were obedient, then the land, even the land, would keep its Sabbath. But the Lord said, if you should be disobeyed, if you should be disobedient, I will send swords after you. I will send pestilences after you. I will destroy your cities. So obedience of the people and obedience of the land is actually one and the same. Okay? So the Sabbath was made not just for Israel, the people, but also for the land. Now that's why you heard me talk, right? About sabbatismos. Finally, God will bring us to that rest, which is called sabbatismos, which existed on the seventh day in Eden, and which will exist in the, the new heavens and the new earth. And the new heavens and the new earth is God's new creation. Sin is no more. It's complete obedience. That's when sabbatismos is also a rest for his people. And that's where we're all going. Now, now I want to talk about the temple or Christ. And Christ raised this issue. He raised the issue, it's either the temple, physical temple, and at that time, the second temple or his body temple. He raised this issue himself. And let's, we can hear this issue, whether it's Christ's body himself or Herod's temple. The second temple. And we hear this in John 2.20. This is verse 19. Which do I read first? Read 20 first because okay. it, it brings the issue up. Then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building and wilt thou rear it up in 3 days? Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple and in 3 days I will raise it up. So Jesus told them Try to tell them he is the temple. You destroy this temple, I'll raise it up in three days. And his disciples even said, yeah, you're going to raise it up? And the disciples pulled him away from the temple to show him the extent of the temple and said, you know, it took 46 years. You're going to destroy this temple and you're going to allow this temple to be destroyed and raise it up? And Jesus wanted to make the point, the difference between his body temple, which they should focus on, versus in contrast to the physical temple. And he said, he, he made it worse. He said, yes, not one stone upon another. So the issue was made. Jesus, his body temple, or the physical temple. And it became an issue that one of the issues for which they wanted to crucify him and put him to death. Right? Now, look at the picture. There is the second temple. It was destroyed in AD 70, according to what Jesus prophesied. 
And then Jesus was crucified. Not and then, but Jesus was crucified before that. And his body was raised. He was resurrected in three days. And then after resurrection, he ascended to be our high priest in the holy place. And then much later, in the holy of holies. So the focus of that dispute is to focus us on Christ, where he's going, his body temple, and how he is our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary since AD 31. That's a long time ago, 2,000 years. Okay, now Hebrews, the book of Hebrews was written to focus our mind, but especially the Israel's mind who had rejected Christ and did not see this path that you see in this picture. Right? They did not see. And so the book of Hebrews was to, to direct the Hebrew mind, the Israel mind, to the heavenly. And so we read this in Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Now, this is some. This is the result. This is the goal this of the, the heavenly. This is the main point. Yes. And it's the heavenly sanctuary, which the Lord made not man. This is the ultimate. All right? There's no need for another. All right. Now, in Daniel 9, which deals with the 70th week, particularly the 70th week, and it was quoted in Daniel 9, uh, how Israel should make an end of sins, to bring in righteousness, to anoint the most holy. Now, modern prophets say, the most holy was for Israel to anoint the temple, the holy of holies. Now, the question is, is was Israel in Daniel 9, which talks about the coming of Christ, was it to anoint Christ as the Messiah or the temple? Okay, was the most holy a reference to Christ or the temple? So the issue is before us, is it Jesus or the temple? And Jesus made the issue. All right, so remember this as we move forward. Jesus made the issue. Now, the book of Hebrews focuses Israel on the end of the Levitical priesthood, but the commencement of the milk. Kisedek priesthood, the priesthood of Christ. Now, this is how it was uh, a position in the book of Hebrews. First, we must look at the picture of Abraham. Abraham, way back, right, before Israel was formed, right, he had a battle, he won, and he gave thanks and tithe to Melchizedek. Okay? And the book of Hebrews says in Hebrews 7 9, Levi who was father of the Levites, the priests, was in Abraham's loins. And as in Abraham, the Levites paid tithe to Melchizedek. In other words, the Levites, true Levi, being a genetic descendant of Abraham, was in Abraham and was under or uh, 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 Melchizedek. Melchizedek is superior to Abraham. And superior to the Levite. Okay, so Melchizedek, who is he? Well, without father and mother, appears suddenly, right? And this is the priesthood that is ultimate. And so the book of Hebrews identifies Christ as a, of the line of the Melchizedek priesthood and not the Levitical priesthood. Mm. All right, let's read Hebrews 5 6. Thou art a priest forever okay, after the thou order. Thou meaning Jesus. Jesus Christ. Thou a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Okay, let's read Hebrews 5, 8 to 10. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, calling of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, this is a priest forever. All right. Now, the question now is, is the priesthood of G 
Jesus to replace completely the Levitical priesthood. Okay? And if it does, then the Levitical priesthood is no more. Irrelevant. Superseded. Replaced. All right, let's read. Next, next slide. Okay. Now, Hebrews 8.8. 8, let's read. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, said the Lord. Okay, this is the old covenant. All right? And a lot of people think, oh, the old covenant was a faulty covenant. No, in other words, God made a faulty covenant. Not true. God doesn't make anything faulty. The covenant was, as I explained, between God and Israel. But Israel went after other gods. So here it says in Hebrews 8, 8 I, they continue, Israel continue not with my covenant, and I regarded them not. All right? So the fault of the faulty covenant was with Israel, not God. All right? Now, so we see a transition. We'll see a transition of the old covenant to the new. How is that transition taking place or taken place? Hebrews 10, 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared to me. So God prepares the sacrifice of his son. Okay, let's go to Hebrews 10, 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. So this sacrifice of the Son is the Lamb of God. It makes irrelevant, supersedes, takes over, replaces all the animal sacrifices and replaces the Levitical priesthood. All right? Because it says he, Christ, taken away the first, the sacrifices and the priesthood to establish the second, his body and his priesthood forever. Okay, so getting back to the, the chart. So on the, on the right, you see the first was the Levitical priesthood. Now the second is the Melchizedek priesthood or the priesthood of Christ. Now, when Christ was on earth, he was a prophet. And the sequence was prophet, priest, and then king. And now he is priest. And as priest, he is to minister to us, to strengthen us, to sanctify us, to bring us through the sacrifices, all right, the unfulfilled feast, the trumpets, the day of atonement, and the tabernacle, which is the millennium. Okay? So this is what he is capable of doing because he is of the order of Melchizedek. Now, I want to focus our attention on the 70th week. Now, we've studied this as the first prophecy in our sessions, the first session. Now, the 70th week is there in that picture. Right? So the, the one week is seven years, right? And in the middle of the week, Christ was crucified. Okay? So, it's about Christ. Now, the point I want to make with this chart is this. If the seven, since the 70th, the question for you, is the 70th week, was it fulfilled by Christ, his sacrifice, his body? Or was it unfulfilled in the sense that modern prophets, and I don't think it's by error, I think it's by design, are saying it was not fulfilled. The 70th week, that seven years, is not about Christ. It's about the great tribulation. So that Israel can fulfill it by building the third temple and anointing the third temple, the building, not Christ. Now, we know that they did not anoint Christ. They did not accept him. So Israel is yet unsaved. So uh, the modern theologians are saying, oh, we must therefore reserve the 70th week for them. And so these um, Israel-centered theology uh, uh, third temple theology are saying the 70th week is therefore in the future disconnected from the 69th reserved for Israel 
in the Great Tribulation and only for Israel in the Great Tribulation. Okay, which is true. Okay, the connected 70th week or the disconnected 70th week. All right, now let's move on. Now, Jeremiah 7.3. It's again an issue of Jesus or the temple. Now, let's read what Jeremiah said. Now, the point he's making is this. You people, Israel, you must amend your ways. You must get rid of sin and don't continually dwell on the temple, the temple, the temple. Just because you're genetic Israel, genetic Jews, genetic uh, children of Abraham, and you have the temple, does not make any difference. Amend your ways. That's what the temple is for. Yes. So let's read what he has to say first. Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Okay, so Israel was misfocusing who they were, chosen, special. God was with them because they had a temple, but they were not amending their ways. So the power of God, the power of the temple was not evident in their lives. All right, so Jesus came. That is the power. And uh, he, the book of Hebrews says, because it is the sacrifice of Jesus himself, it has the power to purge the conscience. Animals could not do that. So Jesus had to come, a body prepared for him, for us. All right, let's read the next. Now, we're getting to Daniel. In Daniel 9, right, which, which talks about the 70 years, no, sorry, the 70 weeks and the 70th week. In Daniel 9, 24, Gabriel came and told Daniel how many weeks are for Israel and for his city, Jerusalem, right? What for? To amend their ways. And let's read how Gabriel expand, expressed himself that they are to amend their ways. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So the modern prophet says to anoint the most holy is to anoint, anoint the temple, the third temple. But what does Gabriel say? You are to anoint Christ himself. To accept him as your Messiah. To bring in everlasting righteousness. Amend your ways this way. The Christ way. Not the temple alone way. Not the genetic way. Not just because you are children of Abraham. Because the temple sacrifices are to cause you to repent from your ways when you see the blood that was shed for your sins. Yeah. All right, so when was the book of Hebrews written? It was written in 63 to 64. And the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So in God's mercy, the book of Hebrews was written to direct that Israel's attention in anticipation of the destruction of their temple to focus their attention on Christ in the heavenly. Okay, so this is from, um, what was it? Wikipedia. Wikipedia. Let's read when the book of Hebrews was written. The use of tabernacle terminology, the use of tabernacle terminology in Hebrews has been used to date the epistle before the destruction of the temple. The idea being that knowing about the destruction of both Jerusalem and the temple would have influenced the development of the author's overall argument. Therefore, the most probable date for its composition is the second half of the year 63 or the beginning of 64. And, you know, other authors, other experts say, you know, 63, 64, 66, that kind of dates right but definitely before 7080 so god's mercy right so in 3180 christ had risen and was in the temple in heaven in the holy place and then in 63 64 80 
the book of Hebrews. Years later, 30 odd years later, was made, was written to redirect the minds of Israel to the heavenly. And then the temple was destroyed. Okay. So the question before you all, right, as far as I can tell, is the question, is the 70th week pointing to Jesus Christ? Or is it that, is it pointing to the third temple? If you think, you still think it's pointing to the third temple, then it is disconnected. And the disconnection makes no sense because 70, 70 weeks was complete. And 70 weeks all together, right? 490 was perfect forgiveness, remember? 490 was 10 jubilees. And the angel said to, uh, Gabriel said to Daniel, first he said, I've come to give you understanding. Then he said, consider the vision. And the word for vision was mare. Consider Christ, Mare, being Christ, a vision of Christ. And then he said, 70 weeks. Right? So the 70 weeks was all pointing to Christ, Mare. That's what it is. So I leave that thought with you. And it's an important thought because if we link our, our hopes with Israel, who still after 2,000 years have not accepted the Messiah, I think there's a certain amount high risk in this, this linking, right? And we can go and look at a few more pieces of data. All right, so the 70 weeks is all about grace. I right? just want to emphasize it. It's pointing to the heavenly, not the earthly. Now, the Bible talks about neither Jew nor Greek. Right? Hebrews 11, I want to focus you and I want to ask you to go home and read it. All right. Let's just read a few texts from Hebrews 11 and you will see the, the direction of the book of Hebrews. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Okay, these all, and if you read Hebrews, they start with, Abel, <laughs> and then Enoch, right? these, and then went down to Moses and so forth. These all who have died, died in faith. So people in the old time were saved by faith. Right? And as people of faith, they were pilgrims. They did not build a city. They did not look for a land. They wandered all over as pilgrims. All right? And in verse 39, we read that further. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Okay, received not what promise? Received not the city. Okay, and they wandered as pilgrims on earth, not looking for any particularly earthly kingdom. All right. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Okay. And they were pilgrims. And they were satisfied, contented, being pilgrims on earth. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called that God, for he had prepared for them a city that is a heavenly. Now, what is it saying here? If they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. Okay, why did they come out? Because they believe. Well, it started with uh, uh, Abraham. Uh, Ab Ab Abraham and all that, right? They could have gone back, but they obeyed the voice of God and they kept outside Ur, where Abraham came out of, because it was paganism. Now, what about the others? 
they were persecuted later. They were persecuted because they, and they, remember, uh, uh, Hebrews was written in 66 AD or 65 AD. There was a lot of persecution of those by persecution of Israelites, the Messianic Jews by Israel. There was a family fight, family persecution. So they were persecuted. They could have returned by saying, I reject Christ now. I come back to my hometown. They had opportunity, but they did not do that. Why? What kept them going? They desired a better country. That is a heavenly, not the earthly. Right? That's how spiritual they were. Okay. Now, through the book of Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 11.39. Now, let's read the, the, the text and I will try to put it in context. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. And God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Now, they without us. Now, remember, Hebrews was written in 65 AD. Israel was persecuting the believers of Christ. Right? So there were two groups. The scattered believers, the true believers, they were scattered by the hierarchy. Now, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith. These all are the scattered, the, the ones that are being persecuted. Receive not the promise. They had nowhere to go. They were pilgrims. For God, having provided something better for us, the persecuted, the scattered, that they, who are they? The people of the past, Abel, Enoch, Moses, King David, they of the past who were faithful, like us who are now persecuted and faithful, they, without us, should not be made perfect. We were both they of the past and we of the present, right, 66, 65 AD, would all go into this place, right, when Christ comes into heaven together. So now, question, if we are to go there together, because they, without us, would not be made perfect. How are they made perfect? Resurrected bodily into a glorified body. Made perfect. So, we, both they and us become perfect together at the same time. So, question. Is there... Now, remember, the, the, the faithful here included Gentiles because Rahab was mentioned, the word. And Rahab was a Gentile. So we go back, we become perfect together. And if we become perfect together, will there be a pre-trip rapture? <laughs> okay. Will there be? No. Because we go, are made perfect, arrive in, caught up in the clouds forever together. So there's no pre-trip rapture just from this verse alone. All right, so let's move forward. Now, that there is neither Jew nor Greek is in Amos, the book of Amos, which prophesied the coming of the Gentiles into, uh, into being God's people to together to build the fallen tabernacle of David. Now, this was 750 BC. This was Amos 9. But in Acts 15, when... Uh, Paul and Barnabas and Peter and James, they were bringing in the Gentiles. James in Acts 15 quoted Amos 9 word for word to justify that the Gentiles are of God and are coming in. All right, let's read Amos 9 on the left and then what James said in Acts 15 on the right. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof and I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen, which are called by my name, said the Lord that doeth this. Okay, this is Amos' prophecy, okay? The remnant of Edom are Gentiles. Edom was Gentile. And of the heathen, heathen are Gentile. And they will be called by my name, called by God's name, and they will rebuild the fallen house of David. All right? Now, Acts is... A few years uh, after uh, 
Christ's resurrection. So remember, we're talking about faithful Israel and Gentiles together. together. Yeah. So here it reads, after this, I return, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. So James, this is James quoting Amos, word for word. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, said the Lord, okay. who doeth all these things. So the Gentiles are called by the Lord's name. The residue means the remnant, all right? So the Gentiles are coming in, according to James. Quoting Amos, all right? So, and there is a, a, a vision that Peter had at, during this time. And Peter saw a blanket full of unclean animals that he, he should not eat. All right. And the vision actually told him not about food, but told him that he should not call Gentiles unclean. So we can see that and read that together. And he said unto them, you know how that it is unlawful Thing, it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. For God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him as God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So the vision is not about food. A lot of uh, Christians think it's about food. It's not about food. All right? It's about Gentile and Jew becoming one. So neither Jew nor Greek. Let's read a few more uh, texts. This is from Galatians 3. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither born nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed. And as according to the promise. So what is this saying? This is saying Christ is, had sacrificed himself. Christ is the temple. And he is up in heaven over the whole of humanity. There is neither Jew nor Greek. If we believe in him, you are Abraham's seed. Therefore, you are a spiritual Jew. <coughs> Not necessarily a literal Jew. You do not need to have Jewish genes to be a spiritual Jew. You need to believe in Christ. Okay. That is the point of his ministry, the Melchizedek priesthood. Now let's read some more Galatians. Know we therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham, so that they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. So if people would bless spiritual Israelites, they would be blessed too, right? And, but now it's like, if you bless Israel, the literal Israel, you will be blessed, right? So let's begin to shift our, our paradigms to this new uh, dawning of the priestly ministry of Christ in heaven for the whole of mankind. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. No difference. Oh, it's so uh, uh, absolute, right? There's no difference. No. Let's not make any difference. Right? All right, now let's read uh, what Paul said. There was a remnant, is a remnant, and will be a remnant. Okay, a remnant means the faithful. Right? Uh, Israel may be large, you know, and, and chosen, but not all are remnant. That's what it's saying. So let's read. I say then, has God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of ben Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God had not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What he not, what the scriptures say of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thy altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. 
even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace so what's important is the faithful is the remnant okay not all israel is israel but god always has his faithful everywhere that's where our focus should be okay i'm showing this chart because we just talked about it right that uh, if you look at uh the remnant line okay the red line it started with adam and eve right sacrificing animals and then it went to abel and abel was quoted in hebrews 11 the first name was hebrews 11 abel right? he was faithful therefore uh, there were no jews at that time so from mankind that green line came set into remnancy because he believed all right now abraham was raised to start israel but not all israel is israel so the faithful became the remnant because Ro romans uh, paul said uh, there is always a remnant all the israel is unfaithful so the remnant line is what we should focus our life our eyes on the gentiles according to amos came into remnancy right and then when jesus was sacrificed messianic jews flooded in even priests the priests began to convert so national israel is a line that the, that uh, possesses uh, uh, the unfaithful as well so not is not all israel is israel so the remnant line is so important so the question then is the everlasting gospel the three messages for the whole world who is giving it it's the remnant that's giving it Right? And the remnant has to believe in the heavenly sanctuary, that brownish line, because we saw that judgment came from the heavenly sanctuary. And the judgment message is in the everlasting gospel. It's the first message. Fear God, give glory to him, for this is the hour of his judgment. Worship what? Worship God who made the heavens and the earth. That was the Sabbath commandment. So the law of the Ten Commandments the second blue line has to be part of the everlasting gospel as well right because it contains the commandments the fourth commandment contains the fourth commandment the sabbath commandment that points us to the creator god and then of course the gospel of grace and blood the covenant the, uh, the new covenant of course has to be part of the everlasting covenant everlasting gospel the gospel of grace has to be in the everlasting gospel. So, the remnant, however, is the one at the time of the end to preach the everlasting gospel. All right, so we come back to this 70th week, right? There is Christ in the middle of the week. He was sacrificed. But in highlighted yellow, it's three and a half years after the crucifixion. And God is in his mercy saying to israel although you slay my son you still israel can accept his sacrifice and all is forgiven and you will be my people and you will bring this tremendous gospel to the world but no in a council a sanhedrin council they grabbed hold of stephen they tried him stephen told them their sins they could have repented but no they stoned him and killed him and that ended the end of the 70 weeks and the end of the seven years of the last 70th week. Okay, so Israel became denying the spiritual, denying the ascended Christ, denying or losing their eyes of the heavenly sanctuary, can only look downwards to an earthly third temple, an earthly kingdom. But the ones who saw Christ and understood the book of Hebrews looked upwards, became Messianic Jews, and then there was Christendom. So we are looking for a spiritual kingdom that is not of observation, a kingdom of truth, a kingdom that's within us. Okay. So I've, if you cancel out the 70th week, then you will cancel out the heavenly. And then your eyes will only be 
on literal Israel, a literal third temple. That's how it works. All right, now I want to give you one of the last charts, all right? That chart in the middle, the Great Tribulation, is judgment of the living. And the Great Tribulation is when there is either, you either accept 666 or you don't. So the remnant is they reject 666. All right? Those who accept 666, the plagues will fall on them. Where are we? We are in the living, the red line. And Israel and us are there right now. The Great Tribulation is soon before us. So the decision whether to take 666 or not is before us. But if we take 666, then we perish. Right? The plagues will fall and the whole earth will be desolated. And because Matthew 24, 37 says that, right? but as in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man. In the days of Noah, there was either you're either in the ark or you're out of the ark. Either you drown or you live. So 666 is the judgment of the living. Just like the time of Noah was the judgment of the living. Either you're 666 or not. Either you survive or you don't. But God is gracious. He's giving us this extended time, this three, three messages. And he's raised a great awakening of people to tell the world about this. So we are prepared. We know what to do exactly. All right, now, another chart to show you that for Israel to play a role for God in the Great Tribulation, they have to be converted before the Great Tribulation. Why? All right, you remember the three messages, all right? The ceiling of the 144,000. Now, the 144,000 in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 7, is the 144,000, 12 tribes of Israel. Now, when we hear 12 tribes of Israel, we think Israel, Israel. Right? It has to be Israel. But no, because it says, this is before the Great Tribulation, okay? It says, these 144,000 follow the Lamb. Now, Israel still does not follow the Lamb. So, they have to be Messianic Jews. Israelites who have chosen to follow the Lamb, then they can be sealed of God before the Great Tribulation. All right? And these keep the commandments of God. Obviously, if they were Jewish, they would keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. All right? So they are either Messianic Jews or Christians. If they are Christians, they have the, obviously they follow the Lamb. They have the faith of Jesus. But they must also keep the commandments of God. Because the first message says, fear Him, worship Him who made the heavens and the earth. That is the Sabbath commandment. If you already in your mind think that the law of God is done away with, is not relevant anymore, you will reject immediately the first message for the whole world. It's called the everlasting gospel. So for Israel, they have to be converted before the Great Tribulation to play a role in the Great Tribulation. Now, Israel. The choice for our minds to choose is between spiritual Israel, of which we are also, Messianic Jews, yes, or literal Israel, which is national Israel, right? The Israel of the flesh, the unconverted, as yet unconverted Israel. And here I want to make the difference between the green, which is literal Israel, and the uh, unhighlighted, which is spiritual Israel. All right, number one, the kingdom of God is within you spiritual kingdom, not an earthly kingdom. Number two, the remnant of Israel bore fruit. Right? Bearing fruit is spiritual. Will not bear fruit henceforth forever. Right? That was literal Israel. Number three, the remnant of Israel grew and blossomed. Right? Who, who are they? Right? These are spiritual Jews. These are Uh, the spirit, if you are Christ, you are Abraham's. So this is spiritual Israel that grew and blossomed. Christians, faithful Christians. Now, literal Israel acts at the root of the fig tree. That's the picture we got. Number four, spiritual remnant of Israel always existed. It, they existed way before, during Abraham's time. They existed from the time of Adam and Eve, from Abel and all that. 
uh, the remnant, the faithful always existed. Not all literal Israel is Israel. That's what Paul said. Okay? It doesn't matter who, whether you're genetic or not. It's a spiritual matter. Number five, my spiritual house, my house. He went, Christ went from my house to your house, which was destroyed in 7080. Number six, the Melchizedek priesthood forever. Christ, the spiritual priesthood, not the earthly Levitical priesthood. Number seven, Christ and the heavenly temple for the world. For the world. Right? Not just for Israel, but the third earthly temple for Israel. Right? And in Hebrews 8, 9, it says, after those days. Right? In other words, um, well, let's not, not go into that. A bit difficult to go into it. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, Re uh, same concept. One new man versus the difference between Jew and Greek. If there's a difference between Jew and Greek, then you have to rapture the Christians up first and leave the great revelation for the Jews. But there is neither Jew nor Greek. So there's no two. One rapture and then a great tribulation, but one together. Right, the righteous raised when Christ comes. Number two, the old covenant transitioned to a better new covenant with Jesus, our sacrifice. Okay, The old covenant for Israel only was faulty. It was Israel that was faulty. Right? It's not that the old covenant or God created the old covenant faulty and that the law in the old covenant was faulty. Right? It was Israel that was faulty. Number three, spiritual remnant of Israel, including Christians, in the 144,000. Not necessary little tribes. Because if they were literal tribes, they have to be converted. They have to be, have the faith of Jesus. They have to follow the Lamb, which Israel is not doing even today. Number four, all of mankind involved in the judgment of the living and Christians stand for God in the Great Tribulation. So in the Great Tribulation, Christians and the Messianic Jews who have accepted Christ, who follow Christ, who follow the Lamb, they will, will be moved to reject 666. But the Great Tribulation is reserved for literal Israel, for salvation. So it's uh, the, the, the green part, the Great Tribulation, just doesn't, uh, should not exist if there was not Jew nor Greek. Number five, the seventh year is fulfilled. The seventh year week is fulfilled spiritually in Christ. Okay? The alternative view is the seventh year week and the literal temple is still waiting for Israel. And so we must distinguish between the spiritual and the literal. I think we are spiritual. And therefore we have to uh, not be led to the literal, to the third temple and to uh, Israel as literal. Now, question really is, the point is, Jesus or the third temple. That is the choice for us. And I think we should choose Jesus because he's the temple. And in fact, after sin is done away with, and that's what the temple was all about. In Revelation 21, 22, we read these words. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Okay, so when sin is all done, when the earth is purified, there's no need for temple anymore. Jesus and God is the temple. And this transition took place when Jesus walked the earth, when he raised the issue, the temple or his body. I want to do a scenario analysis of the third temple, even if it's built, okay? Even if it's built. Now, there's this man, Thomas Ice of Liberty University. This is what is for the third temple, all right? This is what he said. The third temple scenario. I have often thought that the long-awaited permission for the Jews to rebuild the temple will likely be part of the covenant between Antichrist and Israel that starts the seven-year tribulation after the rapture. Okay, after the rapture. That's what he, he believes. At the start of the seven-year tribulation, a covenant is, is formed between the Antichrist and Israel. All right? So focus on the start of 
the seventh year, the start of the Great Tribulation. This is when we're focusing this I, this thought on, all right? If the temple is built. All right, let's go to the next slide. Here's a scenario that I see. Number one, the Roman church with non-protesting Protestantism. The, 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 the main um, denominations have gone back to the Roman church, as I've explained in previous talks. So as the sea beast, as the church, right, as the, uh, the, the church part of the church and state alliance, that is Roman church and non-protesting Protestantism. And the U.S. of A, as the land beast, will unite to form Babylon. Now, you've seen so much information on that. Number two, politically, literal Israel is a U.S. satellite for controlling U.S. interests in the Middle East. That's who they are. They are under the thumb of the U.S. Number three, Israel receives from U.S. funding, military hardware, and technology and is involved with joint development of missile technology to protect U.S. interests in the Middle East. Number four, at the start of the Great Tribulation, will Israel have accepted Christ? Okay. If not, does it come under the definition of Antichrist? Is, is Israel an Antichrist right now? Now, what, what is the definition of the Antichrist? In 1 John 2.22, 1 John 4.3, and 2 John 7. It's very simple. It's so simple. What it says is that if you deny that this man you crucified, who have come in the flesh, is not the Son of God, then you're Antichrist. It's so plain. It's so simple. That's the definition of Antichrist. If you deny the Christ, you're Antichrist. Yeah, if you deny that Jesus has come in the flesh. Hmm. Now, this... Israel still deny that Jesus has come in the flesh. Yes, until today. In its laws for immigration, if you are a Jew and you use, live in the U.S., if you become a Christian and you want to live now in, the, in Israel, you cannot unless you renounce your Christianity. That's how antichrist, antichrist they are. Okay? Now, number five. Literal Israel is supposed to be converted only during the Great Tribulation. So as they enter the Great Tribulation, as with an anti-Christ uh, uh, spirit over them, and U.S. and the Roman Church is anti-Christ, forming an anti-Christ alliance, will Israel run the risk of being swept in as part of the anti-Christ alliance? Number six. So, as the Great Tribulation begins, Israel being still under the influence of the spirit of the Antichrist. Israel and the third temple will probably be used by Babylon to endorse the church state unity as authentic and ordained by God. See, Israel is seen by Christians to be ordained by God, to be chosen. So if they enter into the church state alliance of the end, Babylon, and say and declare because they're under the thumb of, it, of, of the U.S. and declare that the church state of uh, alliance of U.S. and the Roman church is authentic, is ordained also by God, as Israel is ordained by God. Then, as Christendom believes that Israel is holy and chosen, the inclusion of Israel's third temple through U.S. influence, the church state antichrist will deceive the world because Israel, if they endorse Babylon, they will participate in deceiving the whole world. That's the risk of focusing our attention on Israel and focusing our attention on the third temple. I think that's where we end.